key lecture series. Um, well, many of you have known Tyler very well. Um, he has been here for four years, and he got his bachelor's degree in mathematics from Reed College and his PhD degree in developmental biology at Caltech. He has worked in digital evolution, climate measurements, molecular and evolutionary developmental biology in both regulatory genomics and transcriptomics. His current focus is on using novel computer science data structures and algorithms to explore big sequencing data sets from MAC genomics and transcriptomics. Let's welcome Pettis. No, I, I can just dance. Okay, so I thought you said yes, I got it. But you did, and then it died. And really? You had it for a second. You're one? You're one? Is it, should it be number one? Oh, two. <laughs> <laughs> Is it your choice? <laughs> Some, a lot of work that we've been doing over the last two or three years on uh, next generation sequence da sequencing data analysis. And um, it's sort of been an interesting odyssey because I, I came in not thinking I was going to be doing any data structures or algorithms work, uh, uh, mostly data analysis work. And it turns out that in order to accomplish the data analysis that we wanted to accomplish, we needed to scale existing approaches dramatically given the, the volume of data that we were facing. So. Um, so we invested heavily in a, in a number of different data structures that I'll, I'll be telling you about. So I'd like to give sort of inverted talks and acknowledge the people up front that, that did most of the work because as you, as you presumably know in this room, um, professors don't actually do any work and it's the graduate students and postdocs that do the majority of the, the actual science. So mostly this is going to involve work from about five different people in the lab including Jason, Rose, and QP, who's sitting back there, who are all um, uh, computer science graduate students. And Adina Howe, who's a, a postdoc with, uh, that I shared with Jim TG over in Crop and Soil Sciences. And Arin Hinze, who um, is a postdoc over in Microbiology. It's going to involve some additional work with, by Tim Brom, who was a master's student here, or a PhD student here, who left last year. And Eric McDonald, who's a software engineer uh, in my lab. And I have a bunch of collaborators that are sort of the biologists that are supplying me with data. And my funding mainly comes from the USDA and the NSF, uh, either direct, indirectly via Beacon or through the iOS funding program. Normally when I'm giving talks, I'm somewhere else. And so I like to make the point that in order to be somewhere else, I'm sacrificing time with two of the most beautiful children on the planet. In this case, I actually dropped them off at school before coming here to give you the talk. So, so you, just, you can just admire them as being attractive examples of girl children. Um, uh, and I haven't actually sacrificed much to you. Thank you. Uh, the, their, their attractiveness comes from my wife. We need them. Um, so, uh, and then last but not least, I just want to mention, so, so there's been this movement over the last, I don't know, increasing over the last uh, five to ten years on open science, and the idea that um, a lot of the ways that we communicate and convey our science to others uh, has failed to keep up with the times in terms of um, internet communication and blogging and so on. And so, uh, everything that I'm discussing here is open source under a BSD license and available on GitHub. I blog about it regularly, I tweet about things regularly. I recently posted all of the grants that, that I've submitted this year on my lab website um, because I figure they're unlikely to get funded anyway, so they might as well serve some purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's about a 95% rejection rate these days for NSF grants, so, so I was very depressed about having spent so much time writing things that only like 10 people were ever going to see, so I thought I'd just post them on the website. And then um, <laughs> in addition to the publications, uh, the, the publication that we have um, on, on the graph compression approach that I'll show you, uh, the other, uh, our other paper um, on this work is available via a preprint server, which is I think something that, that computer scientists don't use too much yet. Hopefully more will soon. Uh, essentially, as soon as we submit our papers, we also post them publicly 
on a website where they can be, um, an archival website where they can be cited and downloaded and so on. All right, so, uh, so there's lots of resources for you to if you follow up on if you're interested in any of the stuff I'm talking about. The blog is probably the most useful um, in terms of actually explaining what it is we're doing. So, so today I'm going to be talking mostly about shotgun, shotgun sequencing and shotgun metagenomics. And so the basic idea, so this is a, a biological idea. Um, and the basic idea of, of shotgun sequencing is you go out and you collect some sample. And, and at this point it really can be pretty much anything. You can go out and scoop up some dirt, scoop up some ocean water, um, uh, take a cheek swab, a um, uh, stool sample, um, you know, whatever it is you want. Extract the DNA from that sample and then feed it into a sequence. And by extracting the DNA, this is just a bulk extraction technique. You feed it into a kit that breaks up the cells and extracts the DNA or the mRNA. Then you feed that into a sequencer and computational anal computationally analyze the resulting data. Uh, and the, the sequencer basically takes this biological thing, which is DNA, and converts it into data that can then be analyzed on a computer. Um, and the sort of stunning thing that's happened, and I'll refer to this a couple different times throughout the talk, is that it has now become easier to do this than pretty much anything else in biology. <laughs> so it is now possible to go out and as long as you can get DNA from something somewhere, you can sequence it. Uh, and so this has now placed the burden of analysis, uh, the, the burden of the science on the, on the analysis of the data, where it should have been in the first place, but it wasn't when the data was hard to get. Now the burden of analysis is completely on what you do with the data once you have it, because this stuff is all basically pretty cheap, unless you have to go somewhere esoteric or interesting to collect the samples. Um, and so increasingly there are just vast amounts of data coming from this, and I don't think I showed the Moore's Law slide, but, but the data scaling, the, the rate at which uh, DNA sequencing has been scaling capacity has been outpacing Moore's Law for about the last five or six years, um, which is pretty impressive when you think about how much better our computers are today than they were five years ago. It's been, been doing that more so in, in sequencing. And so I've been really focusing on the computational analysis. And the, the main process that we've uh, embarked upon is, is the process of assembly. And the idea is you don't know what it is you're sequencing. You take, you take a sample and you feed it into the sequencer, and it may be from something nobody has ever seen before, ever. That's often what we're dealing with from things like soil, which is full of microbes, but nobody's ever been able to look at those microbes in the lab. So rather than having a reference sequence like the human genome, where we know roughly what's there and we're looking for maybe differences or trying to count the number of times we observe something, or, or whatnot, we really have no idea what's there. So uh, we, we undergo a process of assembly, and the analogy that we've, we've, we, we've chosen generally to convey what assembly is is this analogy of, of uh, paper shredding. So suppose you take a, a pile of about a thousand copies of A Tale of Two Cities, big, big fat book, right? And maybe there's slightly different versions in the pile or whatever. You take the pile and you feed it into a wood chipper. So you get many, many, many shredded fragments of text out of the wood chipper. And your job, as a computational person, is to reassemble the original text of A Tale of Two Cities from a thousand copies, a thousand shredded copies of a, of, of a Tale of Two Cities. Now, there's a couple things that you can do to make this more realistic and more challenging. One thing you can do is throw half the pile away. So shred, shred the books, and then randomly discard half of the stuff. So you don't actually necessarily have one complete book in there. You just have the text from, from, from the complete text of, of A Tale of Two Cities. But you don't have necessarily any one book, so you can't fit the pieces of paper together based on their, their sort of uh, outlines. You actually have to look at their contents and, and do computational overlaps. The other thing is, if you if you um, right, if you think about different editions of a tale of two cities, there may be subtle differences in transcription errors and other things associated with with the different texts you have, and also the process of reading the paper into of reading these paper shreds into the computer may be erroneous at times. So you may have some error rate associated with the conversion of, the, of the, uh, the pieces of paper into something computational. But the end goal is to take this computational data, which is uh, a bunch of sentences, a bunch of sentence fragments, and reassemble it into the original text of, of, of the book or whatever it is that was in there. And you may have no idea what the size of this is. You may have no, have no idea what the content of this is. You may know nothing about it other than that you sequenced, someone handed you a bunch of data from it. This is increasingly the situation that computational biologists are in. It's so easy to generate stuff like this uh, that um, you know uh, analog that, that that everybody and everybody wants this. So so the transition point, this red arrow, is where I basically sit. Um, and of course, it's 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 a computationally tough problem. We're not doing this for a thousand fragments or a hundred thousand fragments. We're doing this potentially for billions and billions of, of of sentence fragments. So of course, the way you do this is you assemble based on word over overlaps. You take your sentence fragments. You look for shared words 
or shared components of the sentence, and you, and you assemble the end sentence out of the fragments. Um, and one thing that, that obviously will cause problems is repeats, where you have uh, a low, low complexity sequences. I, I go with na na na, just for, um, because I think the Batman movie was coming out at the time that I first wrote this slide, and, and you may misassemble sequences. You can often under, understand where these things come from by looking at sort of the structure of the connectivity, or by uh, looking at the abundance, right? If you had one copy of each sentence in the original book, um, then you would have two copies of na-na-na and one copy of this, and so you could sort of say, well, this is probably a repetitive component of the, uh, of the text, and I don't want to assemble around that. And so that's, that's actually exactly what these programs do. So the other problem is that these sequencers also produce errors in the sentences. So um, you don't just have what I showed you before, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. In the absence of errors, many of the, um, many of the uninteresting problems go, I, I would call them uninteresting, because I don't find errors that interesting. I want to get rid of them as quickly as possible. But it turns out the, the most intractable component of this problem is the fact that we have all these errors. Or the first intractable component of the problem is that we have a lot of errors in the, in the sequence that's being read out. So your job as a computational biologist doing assembly is to take all of these sentence fragments line them all up in some way to figure out where it is that there are differences and then resolve those differences, usually based on a sort of majority rule. You look for five copies of the sequence, and if the errors are random, then only one of them will have an X here, and the other four will have H's, and um, uh, wherever the other one is. And only one of them will have an I here, and the rest will have H's. And so you can sort of say, well, majority rules, we're just going to take whatever it is that most of the sentences have as the correct um, text. Right? So your job take masses of error-prone, uh, of, of, of somewhat erroneous, uh, very unstructured data, uh, and extract um, some sort of biological, some version of biological truth, which is the, the source sequence from which this came. So if you give this problem to a computer scientist, computer scientists love this kind of problem, right? It's, it, it's, if, as long as you can discard the issue of errors. You know, computer scientists love the idea, oh, there's a bunch of data and we're, we have to come up with, a, with an algorithm that will put all these things together. It has to be a space and time efficient and so on. And so um, uh, this has been worked on for 20, 15 or 20 years. All of the current genomes that we have, with the exception of human and Drosophila, were put together by this shotgun sequencing approach, random sequencing and then assembly of the, of this, of the sequences. Um, and so a lot of work has been done and there's two basic approaches. Um, one of them, uh, both of them essentially involve taking these fragments, finding the overlaps between the fragments, doing sort of a multiple sequence alignment. The fragments are taken randomly. So you don't, they don't all start at the same point, necessarily, in the original continuous sequence. They, they, they just overlap. And so your job is to find those overlaps, align things around those overlaps, and then generate some version of uh, what's called a consensus sequence, or a, con a continuous consensus sequence, that represents the, what you believe to be the true information in these fragments. So, why is this a hard problem? Well, assembly is inherently an all-by-all -all process. You cannot take the data, these, these raw, these sequence reads, these, these, these sentence fragments, and subdivide them, and, and, do a, and, and do a complete job of putting them back together. There's no structure to them a priori. All you know is they've been chosen randomly from a text of some unknown size. So if you take the, the fragments you have, and you, you subselect from them, you may be taking out key connections between the fragments that, that will be required to let you put them together properly. And so, inherently, all of the assemblers that we have are all by all um, uh, algorithmic approaches. And the problem with that is that uh, when you're, when you're do loading all that data in, you're essentially loading it all into memory. And so you need big memory machines in order to do this. So algorithmically speaking, the working memory requirements for assembly are, are kind of ridiculous to the point where for one data set that I'll show you later, where the estimate is that we need about 50 terabytes of memory. Now, I've asked our HPC for 50 terabytes of memory. They <laughs> <I> said no. <laughs> I, think, I think they have a 50 terabyte memory machine sitting around that they're not letting me use. But Bill assures me that, that they don't. We and just have a lousy HPC. Sorry. And, and next week, you're going to need petabytes. Anyway. And next week, we're going to need petabytes. That's right. So when I show you this graph, I'm, of course, lying. Because the answer is there were no good ways of subdividing this. And what, one of the things that our group has done is figure out how to make use of the biology, the underlying biology of the samples, as a way to partition the, the data sets into uh, disconnected subsets efficiently. So the four main challenges for de novo sequencing and assembly are that you have repetitive sequence, you may have low coverage. 
if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to put together a book from which you've sampled at low rates, you may not have all the connections in the data set that you need in order to put that book back together. You also have errors and very, fairly high error rates to the point where about one out of every 100 characters, one out of one, every 100 bases in your DNA sequences may be um, incorrect. And all of these things introduce breaks in the construction of context. Here, because you get, uh, you get um, ambiguity in what, how to extend a context. Here, because you could simply have absence of information. And here, because, uh, well, errors and low coverage are sort of the same thing. If you have enough errors in your data set, then you have, it lowers your coverage to the point where you can't actually unambiguously assemble, put things together. And then the other, the biological trick that I haven't really told you about is that you have variation in coverage. So imagine that rather than sequencing a, um, Sorry, for some, for some biological problems, you have variation in coverage. So what I mean by this is imagine that I, I'm not asking you to, to um, feed a thousand copies of a tale of two cities into a wood chipper. Instead, we're feeding a library into a, tale, into a wood chipper. Right? And the library is going to have many copies of some popular books and, and, and maybe only a few copies of some, of some rare books. For example, the new Python book. They're only going to have one or two copies of that because nobody checks that out. <laughs> but, uh, you know, for... <laughs> no, but, but so, so you, may have, you may have books that are low that are low abundance and high abundance. And so um, when you're thinking about things like coverage, like uh, is this a repetitive sequence or not? It may just be a sequence that's from a, a high abundance book. It may not be a, a, common sequence, a common sentence that's present in lots of different books. It may just be that you have many copies of that one book in the library. Um, and uh, so a lot of the heuristics that genome assemblers use, assemblers that look at things like the Tale of Two Cities, where you know you have a thousand copies of one particular text, a lot of the heuristics they use to identify things like repeats and, 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 and figure out what are errors don't work when you actually get to more interesting biological samples. And of course, this is where all my collaborators work, not up here. So, 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 um, uh, you, essentially, we, we have all these problems associated with the fact that we can't use existing assemblers in many ways because they have a, they, they, they assume things about the underlying um, data set that we can't assume. So, right, so we already talked a little bit about repeats. It just means if you have a repeat sequence, it means that you may have an overlap that is not indicative of these all belonging together. You may have a false overlap just due to a repetitive sequence. Coverage is this concept that I'll be referring to periodically. It's, it's easy to calculate. You essentially take, for, for something like a genome, you essentially take your estimated genome size. So for humans, this is about 3 billion base pairs. You take the number of sentences you got out of the sequencer and the average sentence length. You multiply those two and you divide by the genome size. So suppose you have um, uh, three, 30 million sequences of length 100. That's essentially 1x coverage of the human genome. Um, so, right, well, 30 million reads times 100 bases is 3 billion. And, of course, the trick is that, that we're not actually sampling systematically. So if you have 1x coverage, it doesn't mean that you have an example of every piece of DNA in there. So you're reaching into the genome and you're picking things out at random. So instead, what it means is that if sampling were systematic, you would have one copy of the entire genome. But in practice, you actually have about 60% of the genome in 1x, in 1x coverage data set, just based on Poisson statistics. So the trick, and the reason we have to deal with so much data, is that... Um, if you have an average coverage of, say, 10x, you have a bunch of stuff that's high coverage uh, where, sorry, so this graph is the number of times each base in your true uh, thing you're sequencing is covered by a sentence. Right? So if you have something that's covered zero times, it's not in your data set. If you have something that's covered 20 times, there are 20 sentences that cover that particular piece of your original text. If you have an average coverage of 10x, this is a simulation, if you have an average coverage of 10x, that means that on average, every base in your sample has has 10, is included in 10 fragments. Half of them are included more than 10 times, and half of them are included less than 10 times, including a small number that are, that are included zero times, zero and one times. And your job as a biologist, sp speaking to computational people, is to shift this curve as far over to the right as possible, so as few sequences as possible have zero sampling. Because I can't recover data for you that is absent from your data set. Sort of a fundamental uh, uh, um, fact of data science, right? We can't manufacture data. So what ends up happening is that you have curves like this that are pushed far over to the right, so you have usually about 100x coverage for the human genome, so about 300 gigabases of data for the human genome. Three gigabase genome, 10 to, the, 10 to the 9 bases, 3 times 10 to the 9 bases, and you need 100 copies of every, on average, of every piece of sequence in that genome in order to shift the sampling curve as far over to the right so you have virtually no fragments of the original genome that have zero coverage, then we can put it back together. Now, just to sort of 
lead where we're going uh, with all of this, one of the places we're going with this is that if you, um, if you look at this graph, it should strike you that this is massively redundant, right? We don't need most of the data like over here. So if we see something five times, that's enough to distinguish between errors and reality and truth, right? If you have random errors, five times are unlikely to, to get the same error five times in the same place. Um, so all of the data that's under this curve that goes out to the right is essentially not that useful. But since we don't know that it's not useful before we run the assembler, we have this problem that our biggest, heaviest weight computational task is, um, is required to be executed before we can discard the data. Um, so I've already talked about that. And so there's two basic assembly approaches. One is an overlap layout consensus approach, and the other is De Bruyne or De Brown or Kamer graphs. And the former is what was used until about 2005 for most genomes. And there's just some technology reasons for that. You used to get long sentences, but relatively few of them. And uh, the latter is used because of memory efficiency. So overlap layout consensus, what you do is you take your n sequences, you calculate all the overlaps between the n sequences, which is an n squared computation that can actually be distributed. You can cluster the sequences based on overlap, and then you do the sort of multiple sequence alignment. So it's identify all the sequences that belong together, then lay them out and, and align them. And that's great if you only have a few hundred thousand or a few million sequences. But, of course, I don't want to say this to a computer science crowd, but an n-squared algorithm is um, not great when your n starts to grow very fast, which is what's been happening in biology recently. The other approach is, well, I'm going to call it a Kamer graph because I think Abdul winces every time I say a brain graph, um, is essentially you break your reads, your sentences, down into multiple overlapping words of a fixed length k. So, suppose we have a sentence of length 15, we break it down into 16. And you break it down into overlapping words of length 12, of which there will be 5. And then you look at the overlaps between these words, and you construct a graph from that, and then you read the assembled sequence off the graph. So it's as simple as we have two sentences, AACCGG and CCGGTT. You break them down into formers, AACC, ACCG, CCG, CCGG, CGGT, and GGTT. And then you just build an overlap graph that says, well, this four base, uh, word overlaps, the last three bases of this word overlap with the first three bases of this word. So we're going to draw a line between them. And the nice thing about this is if you have no errors and no um, path divergences in the graph, you can essentially read the assembly off of this just by saying A-A-C-C-G-G-T-T. -T, right? Of course, that would be a little too easy. Uh, in, in practice, you actually you know use longer Ks, right? But, um, uh, and it would be a little too easy uh, if biology didn't get in the way, of course what biology does is give you sequences where you have the same sequence at the beginning and then different sequences at the end, and so you get you get path diver, you get uh, branches in the graph um, that represent partially overlapping sequences, and could be resulting from um, either errors or from real repeat sequences. So and there's a whole sort of graphology associated with assembly where people put up complicated graph structures and say, well, and this can be proven to be resolvable in such and such a way at such and such a time. And in practice, what everybody actually does is they whip together a heuristic algorithm that makes some random choice based on biology that seems to work for most of their data sets. So the real problem with these graphs is that um, single nucleotide variations cause long branches. So, so let me back up a little bit. So when you're looking at a Kamer, at, at, at these fixed length words, the great thing about fixed length words is you can hash them, right? So you have very easy ways to compare fixed length words. Unlike the multiple sequence alignment challenge, where you have to worry about mismatches and insertions and deletions in the sequences that you're aligning them. Here, we're only looking at sequences that are identical uh, across for 14 bases in a row. The problem is, as soon as you get errors in your sequences, you have a single base error or a single base difference. This could be real for real biological reasons or, or just a sequencing error. Your graph starts to get more complicated because these errors introduce long branches. You don't just get to say, uh, well, we can recognize this as a single base error here, uh, and so we can Draw back. Each of these nodes is actually a 14 base sequence that needs to match identically in order to be to, to converge. And so these single nucleotide variations that are largely due to errors um, cause long branches that are hard to resolve. And if you have multiple errors in the sequence, essentially it becomes impossible to, to resolve well. Uh, and so the kind of thing that people do is they, they look at the graph and they find these long branches and they look for what are, they call bubbles and they pop the bubbles, which means hey, can we collapse this bubble by making one nucleotide change in the original sequence? And sometimes you can and sometimes you can't, and, and, then you build, and then you build your assembly from that. And this is sort of the process by which error correction is applied to this data. 
And it's worth pointing out that hashing is actually a horrible approach for this, right? Because you're looking for the exact matches. And so, so I'm actually working now um, on a grant that's due on, on Monday, which is one of the reasons I'm a little bit tired today, with Sakti Pramanik on how to do a good job of storing and querying this data in ways that don't run afoul of, of, this, of this kind of uh, problem. Um, and I should, I should point out, choosing the paths, figuring out which path to, to, to take in these graphs is not a computer science, it's not always a computer science decision. Often there are things that you want to bring in from the biology, like, well, we know this is a repeat sequence, or we can estimate that this is a repeat sequence, or, oh, the numbers make it look like this is a, a real variant that's present in, in the diploid population, or, or, or what have you. So, so this is where the intersection of sort of the straight computer science graph-based traversal approaches uh, connects to the, um, the biology of what do we expect to be in genomes based on what we already sequenced and so on. Okay. So that's a sort of basic intro to what kind of problem we're tackling. And here's the central computational conundrum that biology is starting to face, which is more data is obviously better. But that's sort of a 90% truth. Um, never turn down more data. You can always throw it away. Right? But of course, just because you have more data doesn't mean the programs can actually run to completion. It doesn't mean that the data doesn't confuse you. And in particular, the problem with more data in these debris graphs, which is what everybody's actually using, these Kamer graphs, is that when you look at the number of sentences you're sampling, the number of reads you're sampling from the DNA, if you're sampling with error, the number of edges doesn't reach an asymptote where um, you've sampled everything that's present in your, in your sample. As you keep on sampling, you keep on accruing errors in the edges in your graph. So essentially, at some point past this initial stage of increase in real information, I'm getting real data from real sentences that are present in the data set, all you're doing is you're accruing errors. And these errors take up memory and, and confuse the comp computation. And so we have this problem. The more, more data is obviously better, but more data leads to substantially bigger computational problems. And they're, they're, it's even worse than substantially bigger like disk space requirements. It's substantially bigger main working memory. So this is where I try to convince you that I'm tackling harder problems than the rest of you. So, so uh, which is not true, by the way, just in case anybody... I mean, it's, it's true for some people, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm flipping your way, so I, I don't know why. <laughs> so, so, so the scale of this problem is actually kind of stunning, and it's come upon biology sort of in, in only a few short years. So there's about a worldwide capacity of 15 petabases per year. It's actually probably larger than that, because I'm sure there are a lot of companies that aren't advertising what their sequence capacity is. So that's, that's 10 to the 15 bases of DNA per year. Individual labs, that means the lab across, you know, across the campus or down the hallway here, like Chris Chan's lab, can generate 100 gigabases in one week for about $10,000. That means you can generate multiple gigabase data sets on a single small NSF grant, sort of casually, from, from stuff you're doing in your lab. All of the sequencing is at kind of a boutique level. The sequencing formats are bad, but generally semi-standard. The analysis approach is about 80% of what you do is something that you can sort of pick up software off the shelf to do. Uh, but here's the real problem, which is that every biologist has a different biological problem because biology is an incredibly large and complicated field. And so we're looking at many, many, many different kinds of data sets. We're looking at human, we're looking at vertebrate, we're looking at different stages of, of, of tissue development, we're looking at cancers, different kinds of cancers, we're looking at um, um, different plants. You know, everything, every lab, right? Not many biology labs do different work from all the other biology labs like that. Uh, and, and so their data set and, the, and the, the, the problems associated with analyzing it and the quality of the database they can use are all different. And of course, here's the thing, the other thing that I've been focusing on, which is that biologists basically receive no training in computation. Right? So, so you have a lab that, you know, 10K is a lot cheaper than a graduate student, so it's easier to generate the data, it's easy to generate the data, but then actually hiring a graduate student, much less, much less one that's been trained to deal with the data, turns out to be more expensive than generating the data. Plus, buying the computers to do it is another problem. Um, I'd also like to point out, in case you were going to accuse me of being pro-chauvinist, pro-computation, most computational people can't biology their way out of a paper bag either. So we have this real miscommunication where you have tons of data for interesting and, and very important biological problems, and nobody that is actually capable of, 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 of sitting at that intersection doing a good job of analyzing it. Um, and then this is one that's aimed at Bill, which is that our computational infrastructure is really optimized for high-performance computing because it's what Intel and other companies can do. They can make better, faster processors very cheaply and put lots and lots of them in a computer. What they can't do is, is make more big memory machines more cheaply. 
And so we have all these problems with massive amounts of data that needs to be streamed through various um, channels. And uh, all the computer infrastructure, all, all the computing infrastructure people are buying more and more processors to analyze the data that can't actually reach the processors because it's either sitting on a hard drive or it's waiting to get into memory. So, so the general problems in this in this are are are, are big, and my problems are also, of course, very annoying. So, um, I can I can justify this number later with some very simple math. Basically, a million um, species in a gram of soil, a million microbial species in a gram of soil, with an average species size of about uh, um, five megabases, leads to about 50 terabase pairs of of sequencing needed to comprehensively sample the microbial content of a single gram of soil. Right. So you go out. We live in the Midwest. There's lots of soil. You go out. You collect a gram of soil. You generate 50 terabase pairs. Then your advisor comes back and says, "Well, how is it different from the, the gram of soil that's next to it?" Right, because we want to know what, what, the, what the spatial variability is in, in microbial populations, because they drive very important soil processes. And they say, well, then I'm going to generate another 50 terabase pairs of sequence. And you can see that this quickly, for, if, you, if you want to do replicates and, and, and proper sampling designs, this quickly um, scales into the petabyte range, where you have petabytes worth of data for, for really a very small, bio a small looking biological question. Um, so we only have currently about two terabases spread across nine soil samples for one project and another terabase across ten samples for another. Um, and that's for two reasons. One is it's still, it would cost about a million dollars at the moment to generate this. That's going to drop down to in the $10,000 range within three or four years. Um, and so they, they balked at giving us more data. And the other problem was um, nobody on the planet can handle this much data as is, so why give us more? Right. So, uh, right, so... And this is where we get this great estimate. If you run the current programs on this current data, uh, on a single chassis, you'll need about three terabytes of memory to do an assembly of only 300 gigabases of, of, of this kind of data. And I can, I can give you all sorts of other problems that are very similar in size. Um, and so our estimate right now, to deal with 50 terabases of sequence, we need about 500 terabytes of memory, um, either distributed or individually, which is actually quite difficult to come by, as you can probably imagine. Um, OK. so. My lab hit this brick wall, when was it QP, about three years ago? We, we, we started getting this data, and we couldn't do a damn thing with it. And I think uh, Bill and Rich probably remember me walking around the hallway swearing, because we, we had interesting biological problems, and, and really no computational approaches capable of dealing with them. And so in the last three years, we've done something that um, turns out to be very, very rewarding, which is combined theoretical advances in data structures and algorithms with implementing those data structures and algorithms at scale to work on real data, and then actually shown that on real data sets that we care about, they seem to produce valid results. Um, and uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about for the remainder of the talk. So there's three parts to our solution. So first, we picked up a, a set of probabilistic data structures for counting. Um, if you've heard of bloom filters and count min sketch, those are the data structures that we've adapted. We built an online streaming approach to compress sequence data and throw out all the redundant data. And then we've developed a compressible De Bruyne graph representation that lets us load this data into memory 10 to 20 times more efficiently than any of the uh, existing um, um, De Bruyne graph uh, representations. <coughs> so the first is actually not a particularly novel, it's not a novel data structure. It's essentially um, count and sketch. It's the simplest possible data, uh, computer science data structure. You take a bunch of hash tables, uh, you have a value, you hash the value um, multiple times um, into each different hash table, and each place where it hashes, you increment an associated counter. You don't keep track of collisions, <coughs> and, and you don't worry about collisions at all. All you do is increment in a counter associated with a hash value of the item you're putting in. Um, and there's lots of fun properties you can prove about this. Conveniently, this has already been well published by lots of different people. And basically, it's um, exponentially efficient. As you increase the amount, for a given amount of data, as you increase the amount of memory you're using, your false positive rate, the rate at which you're, 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 you're encountering collisions in this data structure, drops exponentially, or yeah, exponentially. Um, so, uh, so it's a very efficient data structure for storing and counting things. And our real question was, uh, does this work for, uh, for the biological problems we have, right? Because it's easy to pick up a data structure and say, Oh yeah, this is a beautiful theoretical data structure, but the question is, does it actually inter interact with the problem you have well? And so one thing to say is that our approach is very memory efficient, so this is from QP's work, um, where we're basically showing that in the context of other existing programs, so Tallimer, 
and uh, jellyfish. Our, our implementations of Kmer counting, where we're essentially going in and asking how many times have we seen this given word in the data set, uh, is considerably more memory efficient than any of the other software packages out there. Um, and this is, this is kind of nice. I mean, it's, it's nice to be able to use five to tenfold less memory than anybody else, especially when your only problem is that you don't have enough memory. Your primary problem is you don't have enough memory. The real question was, how does this interact with next-gen data sets? And what we can show is that uh, if you look at the uh, error rate, so this is the false positive rate associated with, with, with the hash tables due to, due to counting problems. So imagine, just to give you a little bit of intuition on this um, data structure, imagine that you have a hash table of size 1. Right? Small as possible, very memory efficient. Exceedingly memory efficient. All your values hash to the same counter. So essentially you're counting the total number of k-mers in your data set. Actually, times the number of hash functions you're using. So, so, so that's very memory efficient, but it's not very useful. So um, what you want to do is, is select how much memory you're going to use for these tables and then estimate your collision rate, which is actually fairly easy. Assuming you have good hash functions, it's fairly easy to calculate. And then see how it performs on real data sets. And it turns out that uh, if you look at the collision rate, which is the number of times you're going to count things wrong, versus how much you're counting things wrong. Right? So this is how many things collide, and this is how wrong you are with, because of those collisions. What you can see is that we can have a fairly high rate of collisions before we actually encounter any significant miscounting in your, in your data set. And this is because these data sets um, primarily are very one-biased. So um, the abundance of k-mers in the data set, the abundance of these short words, these fixed-length words in your data set, is, uh, is, pri is very heavily biased towards one because every time you introduce an error in a k-mer, in, in a read, you generate k novel k-mers within that data set. That makes, if that, I don't know if that makes sense. But errors, because they're random, they represent novelty. Counting novelty, counting low abundance novelty in data sets is very efficient with these count in sketches. Um, and so this is actually a paper that QP is going to send me the final draft <laughs> of shortly. I didn't know how much fun it could be to give a local. <laughs> I can insult faculty and I can, I can pressure my graduate students. So, um, so, so, so this is not a novel data structure, but it's a data structure that's particularly well suited for the kinds of problems we have, which are just counting lots and lots of distinct opinions. By the way, probabilistic data structures and random algorithms are super awesome, so I highly recommend just going and reading some Wikipedia pages on them, because it'll blow your mind. Okay, um, so so then so that was that was our, our sort of entree into this into this area. We we, we gained about a, a factor of ten leverage on many problems, but it wasn't enough because you know we spent a year implementing something that gave us a factor of ten and the sequencing technology improved by a factor of hundred. So our problems got 10 times bigger than our solution just in that period. So, um, so we, we also developed a second novel uh, algorithm, which is essentially an online streaming approach to lossy compression. So if you remember, back, back when, 15 minutes ago, I told you that our data sets were actually very redundant. If you look at the, at the number of times the information content in the original text is, is seen in, the, in, the, in these short sequencing data sets, in these random sequencing data sets, uh, you, you often observe them, in order to shift this curve far enough to the right so that you're not missing anything, you observe many things ten times or more. And many times more than you actually need to. And so what we developed, uh, well, and so the logic actually came from a situation where, suppose you have, a, suppose you have um, I'll, I'll couch this in the frame of, of, of books. Uh, so uh, suppose you have two books, A and B, uh, and one book is ten times more popular than the other in the library and those are the only two books in the library, uh, and you sequence that library, you're going to see that in order to, to robustly sample the lower abundance book, you need to generate a lot of data that's redundant for the high abundance book, right? Because you're reaching in and you're sampling at random. So you're pulling out the same data again and again and again for this in order to get the rare elements in your data set. This is all unnecessary data, basically. It consumes disk space, and because it has errors in it, it consumes memory. So could we, so can we figure out how to get rid of the red stuff without knowing what it is, right? This river. Up front, we have no idea what any of this data represents. And just to, just to come back to, uh, to this graph, what we really want to do is develop a solution that scales with the size of your, the true edges in your data set, that changes the scaling behavior. As long as every time you sequence more data, you get, as long as every time you get a linear increase in the amount of data, you get a linear increase in the amount of errors, you're screwed. Because you're essentially in a, in a situation where you have infinite data and you need infinite memory to represent it. That's basically where sequencing is going, <laughs> is infinite data. 
So, we, we're, so what we're trying to do is figure out what the true edges are without actually knowing in advance anything about the data set. And so it turns out, if you look at these De Bruyne graph structures, these, these, um, uh, these Kamer overlap <laughs> graphs, uh, what we can do is uh, downsample based on, we can assign reads to that De Bruyne graph structure in an online method, which essentially says as we load in each read, we know where in the De Bruyne graph it goes. We don't know what the true De Bruyne graph is, but we can assign the reads provisionally to portions of the De Bruyne graph, or actually exactly, to, to, to portions of the De Bruyne graph, and we can say, well, we only want to collect five or six reads for each portion of the De Bruyne graph. And anything past that, once we've gotten this level of coverage for a particular sequence, we can start throwing away data. And what's nice is because you're not looking at, at the end assembly, you're looking at the in-memory De Bruyne graph structure, when you have things like branches in the De Bruyne graph, you can collect reads for each branch of that De Bruyne graph. You're not losing any information or any, uh, any novel information. You're just throwing away stuff that represents data you've already seen before. And really the only trick to all of this is to make this error tolerant. So that we don't, so we're not looking only for exact matches here. We're saying, well, if there's a couple of differences, that's probably due to errors. And so that was the trick that we, that was actually where the trick came from. Um, and so, so it's a super, it's a super awesome algorithm. It's uh, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a streaming online algorithm. It's single pass. You go through each sentence in your data set. You estimate whether or not you've seen that sequence before uh, enough times. If you haven't seen it enough times, you load it, you keep loaded into your data set, and otherwise you throw it away. So it's a, it's a lossy compression algorithm because you're throwing away data, but generally you're retaining information. And you're actually retaining, as it turns out, 99.99% of the information with the cutoffs we use in the publication that we have for this. Um, one, one key point is, if, if, uh, for those of you that have, have followed along with the Kamer reasoning, um, we're, we're only loading the errors, we're only loading the data in the reads into memory if we estimate that we haven't seen this data before. So the errors don't accrue in the memory. The errors don't ever get loaded in. They get assessed for similarity. You know, you take a read and you say, well, is this read similar or different to what we've already seen? But um, we don't actually keep track of those cameras. We don't load them into the data structure and have to worry about re retaining uh, uh, all, those, all that information until we've already decided that the read's interesting. So um, in practice, this turns out to be a lower memory algorithm than any possible assembly approach because you're simply never accruing most of those errors. How hard is it to estimate covers? So, so, it ter so the, the, the estimated... Um, so the estimated coverage approach that we use is actually to, um, to, 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 take, to take a read, break it down into words, and then count the number of times we've seen each of those words so far in the data set. If we've seen more than half of the words more than five times, we're not interested in that read. Turns out to correlate very well with traditional reference-based measures where we know what the answer is and we estimate coverage. So to correlate very well. And uh, it's actually very refractory to errors. So if you look at this sort of Kamer rank abundance plot for, for, for reads, so we have, we have reads of length uh, 100. So there's 100, there's 80, 81 Kamers of length 20 in the 100 base read because you're doing overlapping. And if you count for a data set that has 200x coverage, that is you've gone in, you've sampled a genome with errors, 200 fold depth. You count the number of times in an error free read, this is all based on simulation. On an error-free read, what you see is that your Kamers in that read, if you just line them up by the number of times they're in the data set, and there's no errors in the read, very closely uh, approximate some number that's related to your, your ultimate coverage. So, so basically, the blue line is we don't have any errors in this read, and we can say we've seen this read many times before, because many times in the data set. If you have an error in the read, that's going to introduce 20 novel Kamers. And those Kamers will generally be very low abundance. But the median of that Kamer abundance plot will, again, approximate the same as the blue line, which is without errors. And only if you actually get multiple errors in a sentence do you generate many, many Kamers that look novel and that prevent you from, uh, from properly assessing things. So, so what you do is you actually get a, 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 a very low level of, of retention of highly erroneous sequences with this approach. But it's very low because it's dependent on the square of the error rate rather than linearly associated with the error rate, shade of the cube of the error rate. Um, and I should say, we're still unhappy with this, so we're actually developing, uh, Jason Pell is actually developing some approaches that don't rely on Kamers to, to do this as well, that actually look at alignments within the De Bruyne graph. Um, but so anyway, so, so what, what this lets us do in the context of this online algorithm, where we're only looking at each read once, is it lets us estimate the coverage of each read, the number of times we've seen the information content of this read, um, 
without knowing, without actually having done an offline process of accumulating all the data and assembling it and then going back. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's sort of it's I'm still I'm daily astonished by how awesome this solution actually is. Uh, if you take a simulated genome with um, a 400,000 bases, you generate there are 20 there are 300 basically 400,000 true 20 mers in that. If you sequence it to 200x coverage with a 1% error rate, you generate 8 million kmers, right? These are all, all, the difference between these two numbers is the number of erroneous kmers you have in your data set, which is basically the problem we're trying to solve. If you just normalize to a coverage of 20, you discard the majority. If you just run this process and collect things only up to a coverage of 20 on the De Bruyne graph, you, you eliminate the vast majority, well, you eliminate the majority of the errors, and you eliminate 80% of the reads as well. Um, and in fact, if you do something a little bit more stringent, which involves an error trimming step, you can actually go from 400,000 kmers down to 450, sorry, you can actually go down to 453,000 kmers from 8 million, losing only four real kmers that turn out to be at the ends of the genome for sampling reasons. You throw away 95% of your data, and you keep virtually all of the true information that's in your data set. And this doesn't just work for simulated data sets, it works for real data sets. Uh, it works less well down here because of the error trimming step, which is something else we're working on. But so essentially, if you think of your memory as being linearly, if you think of your memory as being, the memory required for assembly as being linearly related, which is actually linear or above, to, to these two numbers, what you're basically doing is, is scaling your memory by a factor of about 50 down with this process. And our approach is, I think I... Yeah, so I don't know that I, I, t I talk too much more about how wonderful it is, but remember, this is a single-pass process, single-pass algorithm. We're using um, account min sketch, which is a fixed memory data structure that's guaranteed to be lower than the amount of than the, the size of the data structure required to actually do anything else with this data in terms of assembly. So this is like the, the as close to a perfect pre-filter as, as we've, I've ever seen in biology, because you just feed the data in and better data comes out. Uh, so the key point, though, for the computer scientists is that um, we've changed the scaling behavior. So if you take small genomes that have lots and lots of data, 31, 60 million, 70 million reads, you discard most of that data because these are small genomes. So you don't need that much data to actually assemble them. You scale the assembly time by a factor of 20 to 200, and you scale the required assembly memory by a factor of 20 to 150, 130, which is pretty impressive. And so this is actually, these are all free filters. So we didn't write our own assembler. We're just cleaning up the data before feeding it to somebody else's program, which is, which is actually great, because then we don't need to support complex programs that other people have written. And so basically this means that um, we can do things in tiny amounts of memory that nobody else can do, and we can do them on, on really kind of crummy hardware. We can go out and rent Amazon Web Service hardware for you know, 30 cents an hour, 20 cents an hour, and take multi-gigabyte data sets and assemble them from scratch and do other stuff from them. And, and that was actually our goal at the end, because we didn't want to have to rely on big memory computers, um, because everybody wants big memory computers. So we wanted to be able to rent them from Amazon sort of on an on-demand basis. So, uh, so that's our lossy compression approach. And then the last thing, and this is, this is in some ways the sexiest, and since Jason's not in the room, the first author on this paper, the least useful. <laughs> and the reason for that is it makes use of a very specific biological fact. Which I'll explain in a sec. But the basic thing is what we're trying to represent in main memory are these debrain graphs where we have kmers and connections between the kmers, nodes and, 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 and edges between the kmers. We're trying to represent as many of these as possible in memory. So it turns out you can use a bloom filter to store these things, to store implicit debrain graphs. By taking all of the kmers in your data set, feeding them into a bloom filter, which is just a set membership uh, data structure that's probabilistic, that's compressible. Uh, you can store them all and then you can walk from kmer to kmer by saying, well, can I take this five base kmer and extend it with an A, C, G, or T? Yes, I can extend it with a C. Therefore, I can, there's an edge between these two nodes, so that's an implicit, implicit graph. Um, and so when you have this bloom filter, you get false positives. And what they basically do is say, well, we have a graph that's real in the data set. And, these, uh, and, these, and we, we may end up with false kmers or false edges between real kmers um, due to the way we're storing the graph. In, in the in the um, in this probabilistic data structure, and and our question was how far can we scrunch down the data structure? What's the how far can we can we um, decrease the amount of memory we're using before these false edges start to distort the global structure of the graph? And so this is where uh, <coughs> we um, we did a bunch of things to connect this to um, 
So what do I talk about this? Well, so empirically, we can go in and do some simulations and stuff. We can say, look, if we if we if we load a if we build a graph out of a bunch of connected components, and then we scrunch the graph down uh, in terms of false positive rates. So this is decreasing memory. At what point do we start to see that these components that we've stuffed into the graph start connecting erroneously? And what you can see is that there's a very slow rate of connection down through a 10 or 15 percent false positive rate, and then somewhere past 15 percent, all of the components start to connect together in the graph. And if you put in circular graphs, a bunch of small circular graphs, and ask about graph diameter, um, you can see that you see you, you get sort of the same breakdown. The graph diameter, which is we put in graphs of of diameter 50, or of the diameter 25, and um, the graph diameter basically stays constant. That is, we're, we're putting in circular graph structures, and you only start to get shortcuts between different sides of the graph uh, as you introduce false positive nodes at around 18% or so. And so the graph diameter starts to drop around them. In fact, if you just visualize it, you can see some interesting things, which is that um, as you scrunch the graph down, so I should say, I didn't really do a good job of explaining bloom filters, but bloom filters only have false positives. You never put data in that is then in the future seen not to be there. Whenever you put data in, it's guaranteed to be in the bloom filter. But as you scrunch the size of the hash tables that you're using for the bloom filter down, you introduce um, more collisions between elements, which means that when you query it to ask for particular elements there, uh, you're more likely to find that, that it's there when it's not actually in your true data set. Uh, and what that does in the graph sense is it takes your, your true graph, which is the black bit, and decorates it with a bunch of red little false positive nodes. And when you visualize what's going on at these different false positive rates, you can see the fraction of red nodes goes up. But even at 15%, it's still a circle, and there still aren't shortcuts across the circle in the graph. So you're decorating the graph at a local level, but you're not, decorate, you're not changing the global graph, graph structure. And, and to give you a little bit of intuition as to what's going on, the way I like to represent this is, suppose you have a piece of paper and you draw a picture on the piece of paper. You draw a graph, a map on, on, on a piece of paper. But the piece of paper is big, because it's very detailed, and you want to decrease the size of the paper. What you can do is crumple that paper locally. You can sort of, you can sort of introduce, you know, little, you sort of pull it, make it three-dimensional, um, or sort of, uh, what's the right word? Compress it, basically, <laughs> at a local level. And the question you really want to know is how far can I shrink that graph down before the map becomes inaccurate because I've crumpled bits of the map together that shouldn't be crumpled together. You can also phrase it in an embedding sense for those of you that are um, talking about graph theory. I don't know what who would, embedding comes from some branch of mathematics that I forgot today. So, um, so the question we really wanted to know is how, how far can we push this data structure? And, and I don't know if you've noticed in all of these graphs about 15% is, is where we start to see graph structure degrading, and so we were able to connect this. And um, we were able to connect this to a bond percolation problem, where you have a graph <coughs> with a bunch of nodes, and um, uh, you have a lattice with a bunch of, of, of nodes, and there's some random probability that uh, an edge between any two given nodes is on. And what you want to know is at what probability, as you increase the probability that any two given nodes are connected at random, at what point does the graph become completely connected? So it's a percolation theory problem. So we're able to connect this De Bruyne graph approach and the false positive rate to a bond percolation problem, which is very convenient because it turns out it's not analytically solvable, so we didn't have to do hard math. And as soon as it's analytically solvable, you need to go understand everything about it. But it's not analytically solvable. Nobody can do it. If we had that, we would be publishing in many more papers on this because it actually turns out to be a really hard problem. But um, it's not. We didn't solve that. We just tied it to a problem where we know that there is a lot of, uh, of simulation results and modeling results, and that's how you have to do it. And what you can see is that for a variety of different word sizes, K4 through K12, in an abstract model, there's um, the, uh, the largest component, the, the, the graph percolates, becomes entirely connected at around 15 to 20 percent. It's actually about 18.3 and it's independent of the word size you use, so we don't need to worry about these, it's, it's parameter independent. It's whenever you get a certain false positive rate, uh, bang, everything's connected, right? You crumple the map, you crumple the map, and bang, all of a sudden you're driving off the edge of England because it's connected to France on your map. Which actually happens with GPS. I don't know if people are aware of that. People like drive trucks into the water off of beaches because their GPS is like, if you want to get to France, it's that way. <laughs> and we don't want to do that to biologists because they get mad. So, so, it's, so, so one of the reviewers on this paper said, well, but how good is it? And this is always tough. 
Because you know, how good is your data structure? You can say, well, it's better than anything anybody's ever published. That's not good enough for, for the theoreticians, right? They want to know how good it actually is in the context of anything that could ever be published. So it was convenient is that um, there's a paper in 2011 showing what the best possible information theoretic storage was for an exact De Bruyne graph. And we beat it hands down with this approach. So there, the exact is uh, dependent on the camera size you use, the word size you use, because you need to store the words for, for collisions. And what we can show you is that for a variety of different useful camera sizes, and for a variety of different useful false positive rates, um, uh, as long as you have a relatively sparse graph, our, our data structure uh, is, is um, uh, several times better than any possible exact data structure. This, by the way, by exact, this doesn't take into account any of the implementation details, right? This is just to store the information. So in practice, we're 10 to 100 times better than any existing De Bruyne graph representation, uh, except for the guys that took our work when we published it and built their own assembler based on it, which actually turns out to be very memory efficient. So, so we can't actually make Kling to be better than any assembler because somebody took this work and built an assembler off of it. But other than that, other than derivative work, <laughs> we're better than we're better than than most of the existing assemblers. So we didn't actually implement our own assembler on top of this. What we did was we partitioned. And this is where it comes into the specific biology that we're facing. We're looking at biology where we know we have a lot of different species, microbial species. So we're looking at soil or something where, where we know that there's millions of individual microbes and millions of individual species. And so these should fall out of the graph as components in the graph that are disconnected from each other. And so what we actually did was implement a divide and conquer approach where we traverse the graph uh, systematically and pull out the different components of the graph and then, and then run those through assembly. So it's another pre-filtering approach. We take the reads, we subdivide the reads into different bins based on connectivity in this memory efficient graph, and then we, uh, we assemble those. And this has turned out to be a really awesome approach because we can do it memory efficiently. There are properties of De Bruyne graphs that make this, this very um, good for assembly. And you can actually, the divide and conquer approach, we can actually take those subdivided reads and assemble them on many small memory nodes. So it's gotten to the point where we can do most data sets on laptops, which is pretty cool. Uh, uh, and you can do all sorts of clever things. Um, and it basically, it ends up being an incredibly convenient approach. And, and I like to brag, I mean, we're doing exhaustive in-memory traversal of graphs that contain 5 to 15 billion nodes. And I think I remember a meeting with, with Abdul where we were like, so can you, can you help us out with this graph traversal problem? And he said, well, how many nodes do you have? And I said, a billion. He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> we were also doing not usual thing. We weren't doing anything clever, right? We're just asking, is this node in any way, shape, or form connected to this node? It's hard to do that in a clever, in a clever way, so we just did it exhaustively. Uh, it turns out that sequencers produce false connections in the graph, so we had to work with that. That's our third paper that hopefully will be submitted this week. Uh, and, and basically, it let us scale 20-fold over other approaches for a particular biological problem. And it turns out that that's not really very interesting because we have to change the scaling behavior rather than changing the... When your data set sizes are scaling log exponentially faster than your compute hardware, linear improvements in your algorithms don't help. Right? You're, you're screwed either way. Um, and so uh, this was great, and it actually turns out to be key to what I think will be the final the final solution in this, in this area, but we haven't implemented that yet. I should say, so somebody else came along and implemented the Minia assembler. They figured out how to take advantage of the false positives and not represent them in the final assembly. And so compared to all of the other assemblers that are out there, there's now an assembler that's based on our um, De Bruyne graph representation that's more time and especially more memory efficient by several orders of magnitude in some cases than, um, than any other assembler, which I think is pretty cool. So at the end of the day, our approaches uh, provide a really a wide variety of strategies for data sets that consist of many different components. We can partition and assemble them. For, for any shotgun data set, we can discard the majority of the, of the redundant data and assemble it and make it much smaller. And, um, you know, basically, it's, it's, I, feel, I feel pretty good about it. I feel like it's sort of a clean sweep. You know, we've, we've, we've developed theoretical approaches that change the scaling behavior. We've developed data structures and implementations of those theoretical approaches that actually work on simulated data and then also work on real data. And we're busy applying them to, um, to real problems and, and, and working on publishing those, real, those solutions to those real problems today. Uh, interestingly, some of the things we do actually improve the quality of the biological results because of some of the simplifications we're making to the data. Um, it turns out our algorithms, our pre-filters, are many-core compatible and distributable. 
They have a significant decreased memory footprint, which means we can use cloud computing. And there's dozens of labs already using them, even though we're still publishing them, because we, we put our software out there, we put our preprints out there. People read them, said, hey, this is a problem I have, and they picked up the software and used it, which is actually far more gratifying. I don't, hopefully there's no other promotion and tenure committee people in here. It's far more gratifying than getting a publication, right? Because people are actually care what I'm doing at a practical level and are using it. And it's super cool from a theoretical perspective. Okay, so, so it turns out that, that this provides the groundwork for solving many of the rest of assembly-related next-gen sequencing problems, including things like error detection and correction, resequencing analysis if you have a tumor and you want to know what every cell in the tumor, what genome every cell in the tumor has, you're generating many hundreds of gigabases of data out of that, many hundreds of terabases of data out of that, and efficiently dealing with that in a streaming sense is something we can now do. We know how to do progressive or infinite assembly, where you essentially take the data as it comes in and assemble components out, and, and, and don't have to worry about doing this offline approach where you look at the entire data set. Looking at uh, one of the key mental changes that, that Rich Enbody subjected me to was, he said, uh, you know, there's this aphorism in, in, in computer science that um, uh, big, is, big is, is very hard and potentially impossible, but infinite turns out to be much easier. As soon as you have, is recognized that you're in an infinite data situation, you, can, you realize you have to throw some of it out. And that turns out to be one of the, one of the key components, components of this approach. Uh, we need to work on the theoretical groundwork for the normalization approach because um, uh, there's lots of things that we don't. We, we can tell you it works, we can tell you why, but we can't give you some of the details of, of what the data looks like when it comes out. And then something that Jordan is working on is graph search and alignment algorithms where you use our memory efficient graph to store many, many sequences and then use hidden Markov models or other approaches to traverse that graph and do targeted assembly of specific things from that graph. Um, and uh, so, so that's some interesting stuff. And uh, in my last minus two minutes, um, a postdoc in the lab applied this, applied our novel, uh, you can think of the, the lossy compression algorithm as a way to detect novelty. So he threw it at Twitter. And so he just fed all of the Twitter data in and I forget now, I think this is total amount of tweets coming in and this is total amount of information in the tweets. And you can see the, uh, the, the, um, the daily, uh, when all the people in the uh, Western Hemisphere wake up, because there's a bunch of new stuff that comes along, and then the novelty drops throughout the day as people go to work and become tired, and then they go to sleep and they wake up with a bunch of new things to tweet about. So, it's kind of cool. And he was doing all this on some, like, you know, a couple of gigabytes of memory desktop machine, sort of casually while doing other stuff, because the things are so efficient. Jordan's work, this is an old slide that Jordan gave me, probably could be updated now. Uh, you know, it turns out that we can actually implement, he's implementing his own assembler that is more sensitive than any of the existing assemblers. So we can use it as a way to cross-check whether or not the assemblers are actually working. And then, um, just one last, I think, I'll leave it at, well, two things. Error correction is the biggest big data problem left in sequencing because um, you, what you want to know, you want to be able to distinguish random errors from the systematic variants that come from true biology. And doing this for both resequencing approaches and assembly approaches is very expensive. And so we've developed a way to do that, and when we apply it to real data sets, we can see that our prediction for errors in blue, without knowing the true answer, our prediction for error profiles in reads turns out to be identical to, or, or very highly correlated with the, um, when you know what the answer is, where the error should be. So, so we, have a lot of, we have a lot of work to do on this, and we've written a bunch of grants that hopefully someone will give me money do this work with, um, and uh, so it's been pretty exciting. So just, just to remind you, uh, so Adina did most of the metagenomic stuff, Jason did the, uh, uh, the graduate student CS, did the, um, uh, the graph, compressible graph stuff, which is now published in PNAS with the rent as the co-author. Uh, Rose has been in, was involved in an early stage in many of these things, and QP is working on the counting stuff and proving that, that we can actually robustly use these probabilistic data structures for a wide range of problems. Um, and then Eric is helping us turn this into efficient and effective, better better software. Um, and then a lot of our sequence data came from Jim TG, Billy Swalla, Janet Jansen at, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, and Susanna Train at the Joint Genome Institute. So thanks, I'll take any questions. Hi Bill. See ya. Sorry. <laughs> any uh,